One of the world's most widely used pieces of software, OpenSSH, has recently been found to have a remote code execution vulnerability in it. Anybody can run remote code as root on a server that runs OpenSSH. In this video, we're talking about regression, a bug found by the Qualys Threat Research Unit that allows people to run code on a server that runs OpenSSHD, which is most servers on the internet. In this video, we'll do a technical breakdown of how the bug works, discuss how you can protect yourself from it, and why at the end of the day, it's not as scary as people are making it out to be. Now, if you're new here, hi, this is Low Level Learning, a channel where I make videos about software security and cybersecurity and all kinds of other fun programming stuff. So if you like that or just want to hang out, hit that sub button, I really appreciate it. If you don't know what SSH is, literally it stands for secure shell. So when people want to manage a server that they own or maybe log back into their house when they're out abroad, they use a protocol called SSH. SSH gives them, as the name implies, a secure shell on the remote system. Now what's so secure about it if there are bugs? What SSH is supposed to do is do two primary things. One, authentication. So when I log in to my server, like Low Level Academy, for example, I have to say that I am the person that I say I am. You can do this in two ways, one with a password, I, I say the magic catchphrase that allows me into the system, or I do a key exchange where there's a known public key on the remote end, I have the private key, it does a signing exchange, and then from there I am able to get into the server. Also does confidentiality. So if somebody is sitting in the middle and listening to me do this key exchange and manage my server, they can't see all my secrets because the code is encrypted. So SSH is a very well-known tool, and OpenSSH is just a open source package on the internet that implements that standard. That sounds all very well and good. That sounds nice and secure. So what about that could be vulnerable to attack? Just like any other piece of code on the internet, code is code and people can make mistakes when they write the code. And as a result, the software can have memory corruption or other kinds of vulnerabilities in it that hackers can take advantage of and use for malicious purposes, right? So OpenSSHD or SSHD, which is the software end, the D standing, standing for daemon, recently has been found to have a critical vulnerability from what is known as a race condition. So if you're new to this community and don't know what a race condition is, effectively, when you have software that runs asynchronously, or there are two things that can happen at the same time, if you have critical areas of data, like for example, you're trying to update a counter, if two threads are trying to update that counter, if there isn't a lock on who has control of that data at one time, the code is naturally vulnerable to a race condition where the outcome of the software is purely a race of who gets there first. There is no deterministic way to say what happens. Now, this bug is extremely complex. We're not going to go into the entire thing. This literally would take like two hours to read the entire article. I'm going to do the wave tops here and explain to you what's going on for people that may have a hard time reading this paper, because I know for me, even as someone who's been in this community for a long time, this is an extremely thick article that I'm hoping that you guys get through easier. The vulnerable versions to this bug of OpenSSH are OpenSSHs before 4.4, which is literally from like 20 years ago, 2006. So if you're using OpenSSH 4.4, reevaluate your life. Um, the one of the bugs, uh, the signal handler race condition was actually patched out at, at 2006. It was gone up until version 8.5 in OpenSSH. And then a commit into the OpenSSH project accidentally reintroduced a vulnerability in the signal handler that reintroduces race condition. Now the bug itself stems from a really interesting problem in the world of C programming. So what happens here is if you try to log into the server and you take longer than login grace time seconds, which is a time that you specify in the config of OpenSSHD, the SIG alarm will get thrown into the OpenSSHD daemon. And what SIG alarm acts as in terms of programming or synchronous programming is an interrupt. So no matter where in your code the current program counter is, the SIG alarm will trigger what is called an alarm handler or an interrupt handler or a signal handler. Now the signal handler is called called asynchronously. So even if you're not doing threaded coding, if you're not doing an asynchronous application, the nature of calling a signal is inherently asynchronous because you could be in the middle of a line of code and then boom, the signal goes off and you have to go handle that signal. So the signal handler is called asynchronously, but if you call inside the signal handler, functions that are not async signal safe or thread safe, for example, syslog, this can have a weird interaction with the current memory state of the program. And so what they actually found is that if you are on one of the vulnerable versions, so again, pre 4.4 after 8.5, when you try to log into the server, if you take longer than 120 seconds, when it throws the SIG alarm, you're able to use that SIG alarm to corrupt the heap and exploit a heap memory corruption to get code execution on the server. Now, how do they do that? 
Let's find out some more. So the nature of the vulnerability is if they're able to time the SIG alarm to be thrown at a specific place when another part of the program is running the malloc call. They're able to use the fact that they're able to arbitrarily stop the code and do something else to take control of the structure of the heap in a way that gives them an advantage. So what the paper says here, and again, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm literally just showing you guys like the, the wave tops here. If this code path is interrupted by SIG alarm after line 4327, but before line 4339. So effectively what they're saying is if they can interrupt it somewhere in here, what they're able to do is create a state where the heap is in a different state internally than the user has access to the chunk. So by calling malloc, they're able to get a very, very large chunk that would in the heap technically not give them access to the rest of the further chunks. And the way they have to do this is by calling this set head function that effectively moves the head of the heap further because they've allocated the back end of it, right? But if they can get access to this chunk before the head of the heap is updated, they effectively create what is known as an overlapping chunk. And here in the paper, they do a pretty good job of overlapping it. So by interrupting the malloc call, what they're able to do is they get access to this chunk but what should actually be happening is this. So whatever is living in this hole in the heap, they're able to overwrite, right? Because they get access via malloc to this artificially enlarged remainder chunk because they interrupted malloc before it was able to clean up the heap. And then what they do here is in this small hole, they have a file structure. So the file structure in C is a structure that has a bunch of function calls that you're able to call when you do things to that file. So for example, f read unlocked, IOW file underflow, there's a bunch of function calls in a V table structure that live in that file structure. So if they're able to interrupt the malloc call with SIG alarm, use that to get access to all this memory and put previously a file structure in this hole by overwriting the data in that buffer that they shouldn't normally have access to, they can overwrite the function pointers that live at that location and point it to code that they've put elsewhere in the program. Truly an amazing idea if they're able to pull this off. Now the nature of how they do this is actually pretty interesting. What they do is they do a series of what are called heap grooming or heap spraying, where by sending and receiving a series of key exchanges, a digital signing algorithm key exchange, they're able to control the layout of the heap to set it up in this deterministic way. The way they do this is they give the SSH server a series of correctly and incorrectly formed certificates that form the heap into a particular fashion that allows them to do this exploit that when triggered by the SIG alarm gives them this overflow condition. Now, once they have the overflow, they've proven they can overwrite the function pointers in the file V table and use that to point to code, to call the code and give them effectively remote code execution on the far server as root, which is crazy. But here is why this bug, while impressive, is not super scary. Again, the world of exploitation is really interesting and the bugs that are the scariest are when they are truly remote, unauthenticated and can kind of just happen. You can close your eyes, you don't have to know a bunch about the remote server and you can just go hit it and get in there. Because what they're doing is they have to go into the server, they have to do multiple connections that all wait within the 120 second window and not all of them are going to win the race. They say effectively it takes up to 10,000 tries to win that race where they're able to hit the SIG alarm just at the right point that triggers that heap corruption. It takes roughly three to four average hours on average to win the race condition, and then six to eight hours to actually obtain a remote root shell because of ASLR. So ASLR, if you don't know what that is, that is a dress space layout randomization. In binary exploitation, what computer designers and people who write operating systems have figured out is that if the hacker doesn't know where all the code is, if they don't know where their code is, if they don't know where the program is, if the addresses had been randomized, it is much harder to exploit the system because without a leak, you don't know where to go. You don't know what to set PC to, to make your bad code happen. So because in this condition, they don't have a leak, they have to effectively guess what the address layout of the system is. And because right now there are only two locations in the 32-bit implementation of glibc, it can take either three to four hours or six to eight hours if either one of those locations is guessed incorrectly. So while this is a crazy exploit, at this current time, it still takes anywhere from three to eight hours to get a single execution. Also, 
as you're probably well aware, the majority of the world is currently in 64-bit land, right? So, you know, architectures of CPUs started as 32-bit, not started, but like they were 32-bit for a long time. Uh, and then 64-bit CPUs came out and now they're kind of the baseline for servers because the majority of code on 64-bit servers is ASLR'd, the address space is literally multiple orders of magnitude larger. It is currently not known if you can even exploit this on a 64-bit server and with ASLR, how long would it take? It could take on the order of days to weeks to exploit this bug. So what can you do if you have OpenSSH connected to the internet and you want to not be vulnerable to this? Well, step one, get your SSH off of the internet. I know the whole point is like it provides authentication. So if you can hit it, you need to have a key to get through it. Um, but the problem is OpenSSH is code like anything else. Code can have vulnerabilities and all it takes is one good SSH O day like this to get your entire network, if not the world compromised. So I recommend, first of all, don't expose SSH to the internet, step one. Uh, step two, you can go and update right now. There is a patch out for this that fixes the vulnerability, so that's really, really important. Uh, but also two, you can set login grace time to zero, which effectively says it will immediately close the connection if it doesn't authenticate the first time, which gets rid of the opportunity for this race condition to happen. So I wanna give my hats, my, my shout out to the Qualys research team. The, the, the paper itself, go give it a read. It is extremely long and dense and it takes a while to read. It took me a long time to even comprehend it. I highly recommend it. But this just goes to show like, even for services that are known to be secure, open SSH, VPNs, things that you think give you a sense of security, they do. But at the end of the day, they're just code. Code can have bugs in it and if you, don't know what your code is doing, or if you know there's a one major vulnerability in these things, things start to kind of fall apart. We're very lucky that this was a race condition that takes hours to execute and not this quick like, oh, boom, I'm in, because this would have been detrimental to the world, right? Uh, so yeah, if you like this video, do me a favor, hit like, hit subscribe, and then go check out my video on the XZ backdoor. It really is crazy how much of the world depends on open source software, and we're only a couple mistakes away from things like this happening more and more often. We'll see you there.